Now this speech will be as short as that one. I won't quarrel with Brother Burnside, though, because it's so refreshing not to be debating with somebody up here. <laughs> be the only one. It's a relief. If anybody wants to heckle, you're welcome to do so, because I've got the advantage of the machine here. Well, this is an unfamiliar subject. They said we we're going to talk about the early Christian church in the light of some newly discovered papyri from Egypt. They've all been discovered in Egypt quite recently, and quite a large number. I, well, I had a bulky briefcase full of photographs of them I was going to bring along, but then I thought if I ever get involved in those, we'd be here forever and ever, so we will get left them home. This is an unfamiliar subject. It's an unfamiliar area of study entirely. <clears throat> it's an area to which few people today have any foundation at all. I suppose I have to, don't have much myself, so I have to spend some time laying it. Um, yet it's specifically recommended in the revelations of the Lord to us that we should seek old records and old things. And you know the prophet Joseph Smith supplied us with a great wealth of ancient records. Why was he so concerned with those documents? <coughs> well, they hold water better than scientific findings and so forth. Well, you can see the advantage there. By very definition, as long as science makes progress, all present conclusions are tentative and remain so and subject to change without notice. You never know where you stand there, definitely. But in these documents, we have an interesting control here. We don't study them here at the Brigham Young University. That's nothing to be alarmed about. There are very few universities where they do not more than four or five in this country at the, at the most. Our library is making heroic efforts. We are actually building up in this area very well. But when the recent discoveries began, not till 1950, they started being published. It caught everybody off guard. Nobody was ready. Nobody had paid any attention to the, to the uh, corpus of documents to which these belonged. In 1945, H.H. H. Rowley had announced that the study of Apocrypha was completely dead. He being about the only person in the world left was really interesting, uh, rinsed it in it. Uh, M.R. James reissued his little collection of Apocrypha in that year. Well, it's quite big, in which he wrote an introduction saying these had no point whatever and they really didn't interest him at all. And that was the state of things in 1940. And then in 1946, things started to happen. Two great libraries were discovered at the same time and the picture has changed, but I say it caught everybody off guard. At that time, there were two or three people in America who were interested in, in Coptic. And they were only interested in it for the simple reason that nobody else was, and they gloried in that fact. That was the only thing that appealed to them in the subject. Now, today, hundreds of people are clamoring to get on the bandwagon, and in my old age, I had to attempt uh, to learn some of this stuff. It becomes very necessary today. This thing is widening out all the time. Today, this is one of the most vigorous, it is by far the most vigorous branch of scholarship. Today, and in 1945, it was as dead as the dodo. Imagine that. What happened? Well, we all know about the Dead Sea Scrolls coming out all of a sudden, discovered supposedly in 1947. They couldn't get at them because in 1948 they had the Israeli war, and they didn't, uh, they didn't start to publish in 1950. But uh, at the same time, in the same year, under very much the same circumstances, an equally important library was discovered in Egypt, far up the Nile at Nag Hammadi. Later on, they started exploring around, and as in Palestine, they found more and more and more of these documents. Now, there's a formidable corpus. Only a few have been published so far. Uh, photographs of them have come out. The, uh, the circumstances were remarkable. Here you find, in Palestine, all of a sudden, they discovered a library an early Jewish library, which had been buried to come forth in a later dispensation. It was secret. Nobody was supposed to know what belonged in it except the sectarians who kept this library, and it's their teaching, it's the gospel, what the Jews taught and believed in at the time of Christ and for 150 years before. This gave us a picture of Judaism we never knew anything about before. Nothing like it at all in the world, completely staggered. A whole library, all hidden away. 200 caves have been opened now. Thousands and thousands of fragments have been found. Um, several thousand different works, several hundred works in their complete form. It's a marvelous thing we've discovered. But when they were discovered, the first visit I ever had with Professor Albright was in his office at, at Johns Hopkins. He had a big table, and this Nag Hammadi stuff, this Kenoboski, and that's near Nag Hammadi, that's another library, was all spread out there, and he pounded the table, and he said, this is the most important discovery ever made in archaeology. And it was these early Christian library because corresponding with this Jewish library discovered in Palestine was one found 
in Egypt. This was a Christian library. This was buried in the same way. We learn these people saw the apostasy coming. This was a little village church. They wanted to preserve the teachings of the elders in their purity, so they buried them. Very carefully, the whole library, 44 volumes, neatly bound in leather bindings. They weren't scrolls. They were regular books, the kind we used. Most of the books much older than the 4th century, some of them, quite a number of them, from the 1st century. Christian books from the time of the apostles, mind you. Not handed down hand, hand after hand after hand, uh, so that we have an awful time reconstructing them and following down pedigrees of manuscripts and so forth. But uh, these were the original texts. I mean, this is absolutely amazing. So in the same year, they first were known about in 1947. They appeared in the same way. They suddenly started turning up in the markets. Nobody knew where they'd come from. People were very suspicious at first. They didn't know about these things. Here an early Jewish library turns up in Palestine. An early Christian library turns up in Egypt. They give us a picture of the Jews and a picture of the Christian totally different from that ever uh, that had been accepted by the world. And uh, so they were suspected. And then they started coming out more and more. Then they were traced back to their source. More manuscripts were found in the same place, proving that they had not been a hoax or a plant. And so we have these very formed libraries here. The, uh, it's necessary as a prologue here to mention that the documents of the past have not been found individually or separately. It's very rarely that you find a text turn up separately. If you find that kind, you know that there's at least a thousand years between the author and it. Because all our finds have come from libraries. They've been found in great libraries, and the whole libraries have come out. Beginning a hundred years ago with Layard's discovery of <coughs> the library of Esarbanipal, <coughs> since then we've discovered dozens and dozens of whole libraries, sometimes as many as 30,000 books in one library. Great libraries there, great library at Nipper, the great royal <coughs> archives at uh, Amarna, discovered in 1887, uh, the great uh, libraries at, uh, at Rosh Hashanah, beginning in 1936. Then, since, nine, since the war, 1950 and 55, libraries at Pylos, libraries in the old Minoan language, never knew anything about it before, all of a sudden they start emerging. Whole libraries, libraries at uh, Bogazke in Turkey, the, um, the Hittite records and annals, these huge libraries come out. We get the whole civilization suddenly pops out all at once. It isn't that you have to reconstruct it by painfully finding a document here and there. It's, a quite, mar it's quite a marvelous thing. So this is part of the picture, these two libraries being discovered. There's nothing freakish about that. But as these libraries are study studied and we see how expansive they are and how vast their scope, they began to meet and overlap and fuse. And it turns out to be one big collection because the people who wrote the Hittite collection were carry oh, much of it is concerned with correspondence with Egypt and with the Greeks, with the Mycenaeans and with the Canaanites. And we go to the Canaanitish library and we find the letters that come from the Hittites. They're corresponding with Egypt. We go to Egypt, to Marno. We have the records that all the little kings in Palestine wrote. We have the very letters that the kings of the, of the Hittites wrote. We, uh, and written in Babylonian of all things. It's a funny thing. It's not written in Egyptian or Hittite, the common language of the time. In 1500 BC, that goes back in the age of the patriarchs. Well, these all spread out and start interlapping. And before you notice, before you know, you have one big, one big library on your hand, one vast thing, and so the specialist can no longer glory in his splendid isolation. That's why I say, the more that's discovered, the more is discovered, the more one has to learn. You can no longer specialize. For example, if you're going to make a serious study of Greek epic, you must now take the Old Testament into account. That wasn't thought necessary a while ago. We used to think that there was such a thing as an original literature. See, Greek was fresh. Homer, the first poet, uh, Thespis is the founder of the drama, and so forth. But all those dramas we find in Rosh Hashanah, 1500 BC, uh, in Ketanidish, they were being in a language very close to Hebrew. They were doing the same things and talking about the same things the Greeks were a thousand year late, years later. And now, since the war, they filled the gap because the, the Mycenaean language, the Minoan script B, is the common idiom between the two. We're, we're dealing with one culture. You could, we've noticed long ago, you could take the writings of Jeremiah and his contemporary Solon in Athens, and you could shift them around, and you couldn't tell which one was writing in the Old Testament and which one was the Greek poet. They use the same language. They talk about the same thing, the same idiom. Well, we've never noticed this before. How would it fail? How could we fail to notice anything so obvious? This is because of the tradition of classical literature. The snobbery of classical scholarship 
it began, you see, it's a reconstruction from documents found mostly from the 8th and 9th centuries in chests in monasteries in Europe at Lorsch uh, and uh, Constance, uh, and, uh, well, a lot of them brought from Constantinople and so forth, but most of them had to be painfully reconstructed, and the classical world produced an image of its own that was completely false. It, uh, it lost sight of that unity of the ancient world. The first great scholars, men like Scaliger and Lepsius and Cassobon, realized that. It's hard to believe, isn't it, that in, six, let's see, Scaliger died in 1608, that long ago, uh, 350 years ago, there were scholars who knew more languages and knew them better and could read them better, had access to more ancient records than anybody in the world today. And that was 350 years ago today in Europe. They were way ahead of us. We lost sight of all that, one of the sad things that happened. But they paid the price for their snobbery. I remember the foremost classical scholar in the world. We were um, having tea at his place one evening, and uh, he was very much interested, and his wife was fascinated to learn that Mormons do not drink tea. And after that, they never forgot me. I was, uh, Professor Yeager never forgot me. We were the best of pals forever after because I didn't drink tea. That was the only merit I had, I assure you, as a student. <laughs> uh, but... Um, he said he liked the, New, the Old Testament better than the New Testament, but he never would allow himself to become involved in any Oriental studies at all. Uh, at that time I was studying Arabic. He thought that was rather alarming for a classical student to do something like that because it uh, destroyed the architectonic simplicity and perfection of the classical structure. You looked upon Greek civilization as a monolithic thing, independent, pure of itself, so that Homer was the first poet and Aeschylus was the first dramatist and so forth, and even though it was false, it was at least something you could handle, something you knew what to deal with. Well, this is the position they were in, and they erased this, this unity, this amazing uniformity which is being discovered today. <coughs> the impurity of the classical text studied, since they had been copies of copies and copies, and they studied them for hundreds of years, <coughs> had trained scholars in general to the habit of thinking of any ancient documents uh, as suspect that no ancient document could possibly mean what it said, because all the documents they'd had to handle for hundreds of years since the time of the Renaissance <clears throat> were 10th and 12th and 15th hand copies and had been un unbelievably corrupted. And to get back to the original text took great perspicacity and skill, and above all, you never regarded the text as anything but highly suspect and probably exceedingly corrupt. So when you get new libraries, fresh original sources, it rather knocks you off the Christmas tree. Where do you start? How can you start tearing it to pieces? Maybe these people really believe what they said. The antiquity <coughs> of these two libraries is staggering. They come so near the people who wrote them. In fact, they were written by the people that wrote them. You say, well, why? <laughs> you say, of course, what, what else would you expect? Well, when you consider that the average classical source, the oldest source you have, is 800 years from the original writer. Such a thing as this is unheard of, but a person just doesn't write a letter, and here it is. I mean, you've never heard of anything like that, but that's the way it is. We actually have letters today written by the hand of Simon Bar Kokhba, who, who led the last great revolt there. In the in Mutarabi cave there, they've discovered his letters, written by him, not a 25th hand copy, a, a legend going back to him or something like that. So this changes things considerably. And um, then we find, as I say, these two libraries are interchangeable. What's written in the Christian library in Egypt might just as well have been written in the Dead Sea Scrolls in Palestine and the other way around. In fact, Professor Schechter, uh, Solomon Schechter at Cambridge today, still firmly believes that those old Jewish writings, written 150 years before Christ, and some of them back four and 500 years before Christ, are Christian that they were written late by Christian forgers because they're full of Jesus Christ. They're full of the gospel exactly as you get it in the New Testament. They have no business using that sort of language 100, 200 years before Christ. That's Book of Mormon language. That's no fair, you see. <laughs> but they do. And the same thing is true. Filonenko, a professor at Strasbourg, firmly believes that the documents in the Christian library in Egypt must be written by Jews because this is the way Jews talk. This isn't the way Christians talk. It's true. They're full of... Uh, of the gospel, and, uh, but that's Christian interpolation because all these other things these people think and talk like old Jews. So you can't tell the Jews from the Christians. But you start comparing all the other libraries and the same thing happens. First you notice that the parts become largely interchangeable. As I say, you could take a writing of Solomon and, and interchange it with Jeremiah, his contemporary. You'd never know which was which. And you can do this very extensively. 
these interchangeable parts. Before you know it, the whole business is interchangeable. We have just one culture here. The, such texts can be switched not only in place, but in time. None of these literatures is original. None of them pretends to be. They all say, we're derived from somebody else, and if you ask them who, they'll tell you who they think they came from. They're all derivative. Now, this is a, an alarming thing. There's nothing pristine in any ancient documents you can find, no matter how far back you go. Nothing fresh or original. They're simply repeating what has already been said before and what they know has already been said before. This is an alarming thing. It's been alarming to the classical students. They wanted, as I say, to think that the, the Greeks were the first uh, civilized people the, uh, with their open... Well, there's a new book by Cyrus Gordon out on that subject. We always thought of the Greeks as the, as the philosophical people, the, the critical, the open-minded, and so forth, and the Jews as the poetic and the uh, prophetic. The Greeks are just as poetic and prophetic, and the Jews are just as philosophical and open-minded. And they're dealing with, they're, they knew each other very well. There are constant interchanges between them. So Cyrus Gordon's book, its purpose is to show that we're dealing really with just one civilization here. Now, when you come down to modern literatures, of course, they're highly derivative. And is, there's nothing more derivative than American literature, as you know. We don't have any great original writers. Our literature is repertorial. It's homiletic. We preach. And it's biographical. A writer can only write well when he's talking about himself. And it's adolescent. He talks about his adolescent experiences. You will find every great work, whether it's in Hemingway or whether it's in Mark Twain or Wolfe, they're always mouthing about their adolescent experiences. There's nothing... In other words, they're not, inv they're not devising or uh, composing anything fresh or original. But don't worry, you won't find that anywhere. Well, what's so important about that? This is what's important about that. Along came Joseph Smith, 23 years old, in the backwoods there, New York. And he produced records from all these periods that are supposed to fit into this business. Now you see, if anyone tries to forge an ancient record, you have all sorts of controls. You just start pressing the button, and then the lights start flashing, and the relays start smoking, and your old IBM machine is at work on the project. But um, Joseph Smith didn't know what he was letting, letting himself in for. He walked right into a situation of which no one would have dreamed 20 years ago, even. Because now we can control these things, he writes. What does he do? In the Pearl of Great Price, he reaches back into an earlier period and an older language than any yet known in the world at his time. Nobody could read Egyptian. And the first poor, feeble attempt at an Egyptian grammar was 1838. And uh, so he gives us the Pearl of Great Price with all this stuff in it. Now, see what this implies. Uh, when you go back to a literature like this, you don't uh, just deal with the plot of the story. They're, um, they're thought forms, called thought forms. They're types of expression. They're peculiar idioms. They're ways of putting things and ways of looking at things. And you can't mistake them. I mean, they're as characteristic as a, as a person's physiognomy. In the Doctrine and Covenants, he comes along and he opens the door to the original gospel of the original church. This is the way it was in the time of Jesus Christ. This is the way they did in the old church. This is the way it was in the church of the apostles. Well, that's an interesting thing. And then in the Book of Mormon, he comes along and he cuts a great big slice right out of the middle of the richest period of ancient literature when everything was fused together out of the time and the place. This today, the philosopher, um, what's his name? Um, oh, I know so well. Well, I think in a second. Uh, he calls it the Axial, Jaspers, Carl Jaspers calls it the Axial period because it was 600 B.C., that the perfect fusion takes place between all these cultures. You can't tell one from the other. It was very rich. See, this was the last revival of the Babylonian Empire. See, this is the Neo-Babylonian Empire, last big literary revival. And they were terrific antiquarians. They dug into the records. They brought everything out. Nabonidus boasted about it. And uh, they produced these tremendous libraries at that very time. The same thing was happening in Egypt under the 26th dynasty, the great revival. Tremendous archaistic movements. They dug up all the old records. They got everything going. And Israel's right in the middle, right in the midst of all this. We know from Canaanitish records and so forth. The Book of Mormon then cuts a big slice right out of the middle of this, of this world's religious and cultural tradition when they're fused. They were fused at this time and place as never before or since. This was a time when certain idioms were formed, when forms of expression were fixed and so forth, and he gives us a generous ex uh, sampling of documentation from three crucial periods. He? From the age of the patriarchs, Book of Abraham, you see, the Pearl of Great Prize, from this axial period of 600 B.C., the most significant 
in literary production. That time, every one of the major Greek writers was alive, with the exception of Homer, who just died. It was amazing. Everybody was living then. That's why he calls it axial. Every great philosopher, everything really basic, was right around that year 600. Whether it's east or west, that's the axis around which all history pivots, according to Carl Jaspers. And thirdly, he gave us a generous sampling of the apostolic age, the time of the apostle, the time of Jesus Christ. Now, in the 1930s came the first great discoveries, what they call today the rediscovery of the age of the patriarchs. They began discovering that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not solar myths, but real people. For the first time, it's today that the oneness of the axial period is being recognized. I mentioned Cyrus Gord, I mentioned Carl Jaspers and people like that, that you could interchange the writings from any country at this time and everybody be completely at home. Because the world was, was completely covered with a network of universities in that time, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Hugo, uh, not Winkleman, uh, showed this some years ago. And everybody, you had to travel from one to the other. This system of traveling around from school to school, and you had to receive your education at certain seats of learning, you couldn't just stay home. This was fixed and established at that time, and everybody did it. It was a worldwide culture. The records say there was one worldwide language predominating and so forth. You, you see this in everything. Then since the 1950s, the time of Christ has been discovered for the first time. We really know now what the Jews believe. We didn't know before. We really know now what the Christians believe. We didn't know before. Analyze them here. The striking thing in this, one of the striking things, is you don't have any evolutionary development here. The greatest works are always at the first. The rest is just marking time. The greatest works don't pretend to be original, as we've said before. They're handed down. They're the writings of the Father. They're the, the Mejunetir, the words of the gods that have been handed down. Um, we have been conditioned to look for a growth and development in everything, and this has crippled the study of the humanities, as you know, in many fields. Uh, music is not better today than it was in the time of Bach. It may be different, but it's not better. And this is true with these written documents, too. The greatest comes first. And the experts are forced to admit, this is an interesting thing, that the same gospel, this came out with the discovery of the age of the patriarchs. But there is no development among the prophets from a, from a ritual type of religion to a prophetic type, to a poetic type, or the other way around. Um, that what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob preach in the beginning is just what the prophets are preaching later on, and it's what you find in the New Testament. In other words, it's the same gospel and the same theology and the same morality is characterized of these, characteristic of these three periods. If you go back to the earliest documents we have, like the Shabbat of Stormer, the Enuma Elish in Babylonian record, you will find everything you will find in the gospel, these familiar motifs. What do you find in all of these records? Now remember, these libraries are nearly all temple libraries. They're court libraries, but they're kept in the temples. That's one of the purposes of the temple, is to keep a record of all the past. And they're ritual texts and their doctrinal texts. So we have plenty of religious material to go on, thousands of on. No one has begun to read even a fraction of this stuff. We don't even know what's in most of the stuff this day. And uh, this is what you find there. They all tell about the pre-existence, the council in heaven, the controversy that took place there, the casting out of Satan, the two ways. We find many documents under that name. This life is two ways. It's a time of probation. Here, at every moment of your life, you are faced with a choice between this and that. It's never too late to make a right choice as long as you are in the blessed vessel. You may have made the wrong choices forever and ever, but right now you can still make the better choice. And while you're here, that's a great blessing. This is the doctrine of the two ways, and you will be judged according as you have chosen it here. The judgment then. Men are prone to fall because the devil is here at work. And so they need to be cleaned up. They need a redeemer. Even when they decide to repent, and all need to repent, and who is to clean them up? Who is to take care of the poor, miserable, fallen human race? Because they all talk about the fall. They're aware of that. And uh, they have to bring in the redeemer here. With the uh, doctrine of redemption comes a body of rites and ordinances. And that's the purpose of all this theological stuff, is to explain the rituals and ordinances of these temples. Now, we know what the rites and ordinances of these temples are. They have been compared very widely. Again, this is new. It wasn't until 1930 that a number of people at Cambridge who've been working in different areas compared, decided to compare notes. And 
compare the rituals of a dozen different cultures at the earliest times, and lo and behold, they were all the same ordinances, same rite. So they gave it a name. They call it Patternism, since their emphasis there is on the royal rite, the coronation, the place of the king as chief priest and father of the nation and so forth. But uh, behind this doctrine of pre-existence, the council of fall, the redeemer, is the necessity of men participating in certain rites here upon the earth. And what were these rites? Well, baptism. I mean, real baptism. There's been several recent studies written on the baptism of Pharaoh. He was really baptized. And along with that, after baptism, there is always a washing and anointing. A good deal is said about that. And in this Christian library that's come out, you can't open anywhere at a page without seeing the word sealing on it somewhere. This we first became aware of in 1906 with the discovery of the Odes of Solomon in Mesopotamia. Since then, this strange Christian obsession, early Christian obsession with sealing is a very interesting thing. Well, after the baptism, a person receives a, a special garment and then he is, uh, participates in a feast, in a sacramental meal, which is the sacrament, looking forward to the coming of the Savior, looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. It's all there. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have all this before the time of Christ, so that Professor Cross calls it the Church of Anticipation. It's all there, but it's an anticipation. And doesn't the Book of Mormon say that? We, we knew that the salvation didn't come by the my, by the law of Moses, but we did these things because they pointed our minds forward. He says these things were a type and a shadow of things to come. This is why these people out at Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls people, did these things. They didn't believe that they had the, they were waiting for the prophet of Aaron and Israel to come, as they say. They'd gone out there to prepare the way to live so purely that the Lord might restore the rites of the temple in their purity. They tell us that's their purpose in going there. And then the highest of these ordinances, of which they have a good deal to say, and this is one thing that's been coming out just since really in the last three or four years, the great emphasis on marriage as the culminating ordinance of all, the celestial eternal marriage, which leads to exaltation. Now, these things are becoming familiar today. This scheme is standard. In its royal rites, it's received the title, as I say, of patternism, and you find it everywhere the same. This Egyptian Christian library, these motives predominate. And there are two dominant themes in the early church. The first is the apostasy. They're expecting the end. That's why they bury this library. Just as the Jews at Qumran, when they saw the Roman soldiers moving in, they expected the end and they hid them up. They buried them up as you bury a mummy in the desert to come forth at a later time in a later dispensation. The writings themselves tell us this today. This has only been recently realized. These were deliberately laid up with that in mind. And this is true of this Christian library, too. They saw the church was going sour, and they knew, and this is quite common, they knew that the Lord had taught that it was only to be there for two generations. So they're laying this up for a later time. After it, there would be Christians. Of course, plenty of Christians. Many will come in my name, the Lord has said. Don't let that throw you. He says, uh, they shall do many things in my name. And at that time, he says, they shall say, lo, here is Christ, and lo, here, but believe none of them. At a time when everybody would be paying lip service to the name of Christ, don't believe any of them. Well, they knew all that. They knew that the name would survive, and the forms of the church, the imagery they put is that of an inferior tower, a second-class church would take their place, they say, with the forms, but the ancient rites, the apostles, the knowledge of things would pass away completely. There's a great deal written about this. Well, uh, they're constantly insistent on the apostasy then and their awareness of it, the future of the church. And where did they get this information? This is the other one. It's on the resurrection. Everyone was already denying the resurrection. And this is the thing we learned from these Egyptian texts. They really believed in the resurrection. The Lord did come and visit them off and on for six weeks after the resurrection for 40 days. This is a thing the later church would never take. They threw it out, and this is what the big fight is about. They waged a terrific combat about that. They finally believed that they, well, as it was predicted, those that believed this were finally stamped out completely, and they expected to be. What has been the reaction to these uh, discoveries? This is the interesting thing. They're quite recent. It's soon to say, but definite phases uh, have already appeared. There have been marked phases since 1947. Let's say 47. F let's say 50, when the first photographs of the Dead Sea Scrolls were published at Yale. Well, first of all, they brushed everything aside. They said, well, this is just Gnostic stuff. And then it started piling up. And today, in the re recent studies, well, as Harris says, if this is Gnosticism, would all Christians were Gnostics? 
And Van Unick, the Dutchman, says, look, every time you call something Gnostic, you look in the New Testament and it's there too. See, you can check this stuff because we have a canon to check it against. It goes beyond. It's Gnostic was a useful word to condemn anything you didn't like. So now that nobody knows what to, exactly what was Gnostic. But it, uh, they no longer do that. They no longer brush this stuff aside as saying Gnostic. They say, well, it may be Gnostic, but it's what the early Christians believed. And then the next phase was a great concern for originality. Well, if these are genuine Christian documents and genuine Jewish documents, where is the originality of Christ? This is the thing that worried the Roman Catholic writers especially because they like to think of the uniqueness and originality of a one-act play in which the human race had fallen. Jesus Christ came. He uh, established the kingdom of God on earth and its triumphant march through the world is to be the future of history. Well, that's not the story we read in any of these early documents where they have the doctrine of dispensation. And this is the thing that everyone's talking about today is dispensationism. But uh, they were concerned about originality here. The Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, how would it happen that they would have baptism, that they would have the sacrament, that they would use the name, the they talk about Christ, of course, the Messiah, it's the only name they have, talking about Jesus all the time, the Lord Jesus, call him Joshua, call him Savior, and all these things just like the Church of Alma. Why would they have a Church of Anticipation? Well, uh, the Dutch for a while suggested a theory. They said, this comes from an old pre-Christian gnosis. There was a gnosis in pre-Christian times, and this is what it is. That broke down after about 10 years, and they gave it up. I don't think anyone today subscribes to the doctrine of a pre-Christian gnosis. They didn't know what to do with it. See, they don't want to acknowledge this. This is the trouble. Well, the next phase was to deny that these things are significant. They lack any major... They lack the majesty, we'll say. They lack the simplicity. They lack the spirituality of the Gospels. But now, as these documents accumulate, we realize that the Gospels also lack the majesty, the simplicity, and the spirituality of the Gospels. They're not majestic and simple at all. Jesus, the great teacher today... No, they say Jesus was not a great teacher. He wasn't that at all. He had a totally different message. He's not uh, giving them moral precepts at all. And this is the thing that everybody's saying now. After all, you take every major announcement of Christ in the, in the Gospel of John, for example. Every time he announces himself or his calling or says something really basic, what is the reaction to his hearers? If it's the Jews, they try to stone him. If it's his apostle, they get angry, fight among themselves, they desert him. They can't understand him and they're puzzled. They say, what does he mean by this? What does he mean by this? Now, what kind of a great teacher would enrage and puzzle his students every time he opened his mouth? Uh, he's not giving them moral precepts. They would understand that. And incidentally, this is a, uh, an argument that's being used a lot today. The very oddness of all this stuff shows it must be genuine. People aren't going to come together and of their own will and, and volition invent a gospel and a concept of a savior that is a slap in the face, as Carl Hall says, to everything that's ever been taught before or everything that human reason has conceived ever since. His very offensiveness shows that nobody invented it. They didn't want it. Nobody wanted to believe in the resurrection, as you know. They had to twist their arm. Nobody did. Read those passages in the New Testament. When the, when the women reported they'd seen the risen Lord, they laughed at him. They said, no, this is absurd. And when they saw him, they were afraid. They tried to run away. And he said, look, you, I'm going to give you a demonstration here. And the, uh, <laughs> Thomas wasn't present for the demonstration. Remember, he ate with them. He ordered them to bring food, to bring fish and honeycomb, and he ate. He lit a fire on the beach. One Catholic writer says, this is absolutely incredible. He says, the Lord of heaven and earth comes. He sits down beside a smoky fire at a table in some middle-class tenement with a lot of greasy, dirty, ignorant apostles, and he eats their filthy food with them, he says. You can't go for a thing like that. This was the story. Well, they didn't want to believe it either, you see. The apostles were very reluctant to believe it. They would run away. They would argue against it. They would laugh at those that brought them the news. You know what Thomas said, who was absent at the first demonstration. He had to be given a private demonstration. And then he saw, then he saw that that was so. In other words, this has never been a popular doctrine. And the Christians were just so eager to get rid of the doctrine of the, of the resurrection. By Augustine, they threw it out completely. It was a spiritual resurrection. They settled for that. But these things weren't invented, you see. And no one would accept these doctrines, let alone invent them, but no one would accept them unless they had very good credentials. Nobody wanted to believe this stuff. Nobody wanted to believe this gloomy, terrifying picture of the church. Now, all these records have to do, the, all these Egyptian records, incidentally, have to do with the teachings of the Lord to the apostles during the 40 days after the resurrection. Did he really come to them and teach them? Well, they wouldn't have invented these teachings, and this is pointed out today. At the time of the resurrection, 
the apostles were not ready to hear the gospel, let alone preach it. Remember when the Lord came to them, he rebuked them for their hardness of heart and their blindness. At the last chapter of Luke, you know, and he has to begin, he says, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained everything to them out of the scriptures. And then it tells us their eyes were open, they began to understand. We don't have a word of what he told them after the 40 days. Now, all these newly discovered writings claim to be that teaching. Are they genuine or aren't they? Well, for one thing, they hang together. They hang together beautifully. They give a very consistent picture of the gospel. For another thing, nobody would ever have invented them. These aren't odds and ends in the manner of the Gnostics when they take tatters of Oriental philosophy and everything and throw them together into patchwork systems. This is a very consistent gospel, exactly as we have it ourselves. Well, back to the present trends then. They denied that they were significant. They said they lacked these trends. <coughs> But now we realize that we've been reading this austerity and simplicity into the New Testament. There's a totally new trend in all the churches today. That's the Catholic, Protestant, and all the rest. The possibility that there may be literal truth behind these things. The, in 1955, they started a new, a new thing, and everybody again starts writing about this. We have, a, incidentally, our library has been very conscientious in subscribing uh, to the main journals, and we have a, a pretty good collection now running for the last... 15 or 20 years. They cover the ground pretty well. But in 1955, you know, it's about then, they start saying, now look, we may not like what these things say. We may think the primitive Christians were just about as primitive as anybody could be, but they were the Christians. And if we're going to call ourselves Christians, we better do something about it. How can we accommodate our teachings to theirs? If we're going to call ourselves Christians, we must believe what they believe. They say, oh, no, this is terrible. We can't bring ourselves to that. No, but Jesus Christ himself believed that. Can we, they say, call ourselves Christians and renounce the things that he firmly believed in? So this is a thing that's worrying everybody today. The idea is getting back to, back to. So everybody's talking about rediscovery today. This has led to a general liturgical and doctrinal reappraisal. And behind this that's happening at Rome, the ecumenical council there, and what's going on everywhere else, among the Protestants, is these new documents. They're, they're the pushing, they're the driving force behind it. People are beginning to suspect reluctantly at first, but now they cannot deny it anymore that the early Christian church is not what we thought it was, and the, the Jews did not preach what we thought they did at the time of Christ. So this general liturgical and doctrinal reappraisal is a very interesting thing. It's so fundamental. They're changing all sorts of things today. They realize that their liturgy is impoverished. The seven duties of the Catholic Church, only two of those have any reference whatever to the early church. I mean, they, would, they include confession, they include festivals and things not mentioned anywhere in the Bible, never mentioned in early Christian literature. What is mentioned there? These rites we've been talking about. For example, last year, just last year, the Roman Church has renounced a, an ordinance which has been in effect ever since, certainly ever since the Second Council of Constantinople, uh, the extreme unction. That was a Gnostic practice. And in its place, they have restored anointing of the sick. Well, anointed with oil. Well, this is a thing that they've never had before, and the other Christian churches are doing the same thing. Why? These documents are full of it. They're full of anointing the sick with oil. That one of the most interesting in the Dead Sea Scrolls is the Genesis Apocryphon, the doctrine, the Gospel of, not Gospel in this case, it's the Book of Lamech, one discovered there, which you have a fuller account of the story of Abraham in Egypt. Abraham gets on the good side of the Pharaoh because when he is in Egypt, if Pharaoh is sick. It's reported by one of the important men around him, that there is a, an important man in the country who can heal the sick by laying hands on them. And Abraham puts oil on Pharaoh's head and heals him. He blesses him. And that is what put him into good favor with Pharaoh and why he was willing to exchange favors with him and let him sit on his throne wear his crown and so forth. It, that's not told there, as in the Pearl of Great Price. But he did want to exchange priesthoods with him. He did want Abraham's authority, and in return he would give him his. But... Uh, this is the, the new trend. So today, they're, always talk, they're all talking about rediscovery. We talk about the rediscovery of the patriarchal age. That began it in the 1930s. Then they talk about a lot about the rediscovery of the church. Well, what had happened to the church? You mean you haven't rediscovered it? Well, look what you, you get in the, on the, in the eighth tablet of the Sarek Scroll, what used to be called the Manual of Discipline, description of the organization of the Jews out here in the desert. They have a bishop at their head. You know, he goes around and visits their presiding bishops. Each church has a general conference, but it has 12 elders at its head. These are presided over by a, a presidency of three that have to be priests with authority from Jerusalem. 
everything is done by these at the, the presidency with the consultation of the twelve and then all the community vote on it. Well now this is before the time of Christ, this organization. You see why they said, well it threatens the originality of Christianity. How can, you have, how can we know? They thought that the church grew up later on in the memory of Christ in the fourth and fifth century they established uh, the churches. This has long been the theory. But now we, we realize that all those patterns were there and they've been carried on from early times. The sacrament is a good example. Less than a year ago, uh, Alfred Adam, a German scholar who lives in Palestine, showed that the site. Now, this is an interesting thing. He showed in a very recent issue of the uh, Theologische Zeitung, Literaturzeitung. He uh, showed that the sacrament went back to the temple, went back to the showbread of the temple, in which the people were divided into 12 groups. There was a loaf for each group, it was divided by 12s. And uh, every day, the opening session of the temple, those who were to minister in the temple that day would go to the east end, where there was a little room behind the east door of the temple nobody ever used. And there was a table on which these little loaves were placed in a row, 12 of them. That's why they're called the showbread. They were on display there. They're visible. Each of these would partake of the loaf of bread, representing the house of Israel. But first of all, they would have to bathe. They would have to be washed and baptized. They would go into a tank, down seven steps, up seven steps, and be washed off. And then they would partake of this bread uh, for each of the twelve tribes. Now this was in the temple before the time of Christ. And remember in 3 Nephi, when the Lord is about to visit them? He, and incidentally, as Adam showed, this was in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. This was the banquet of the Messiah they were celebrating, looking forward to the time when they would partake of it with him. And you'll read in 3 Nephi, when they did partake of it with him in this country, how did he do it in the new world? He ordered them the night before he was to come. Remember, he says, now you get ready for me tomorrow. And he ordered each of the apostles to divide the people into twelve. Each apostle was to instruct one of the twelve. Every one of them, whether they'd been baptized before or not, was to go down and get baptized. Then after they'd got baptized, they were to come up. And then he multiplied the loaves and he blessed them. And the apostles distributed the loaves to them by twelves. It was all done in these sections of twelves. This is the way the sacrament was carried out. There's a very interesting writing discovered in... 1913, it's rather a recent one, uh, rather an older one. One of these Egyptian writings, incidentally, it's from these uh, things, uh, called the Gospel of the Twelve Apostles, in which the sacrament after the resurrection is described, and it's exactly as in 3rd Nephi. It, it includes the blessing of the children. It includes the Lord going aside three times and praying. This is what they said he did after the resurrection. He prayed the first time his face was shining. The second time he came back and ble blessed the apostles, their face was shining. The third time he went, he came back. There was a general Pentecost. All the people's countenances were shining. They had received of his glory as he prayed the Father in three steps. He went apart and th prayed three times. See, he does that in the book of in Third Nephi. Think of the boldness of trying to reconstruct what the Lord did after the resurrection. You don't have a word of it in the Bible. Um, Think of having to do that. Joseph Smith says, look, Joseph, uh, Jesus Christ came here after his resurrection. Oh, so what did he do? What did he say? You just try to tell us that, you see. Wouldn't that put anyone, wouldn't that get anyone to sweating and drawing back and say, no, I better not talk about that now. <laughs> Joseph Smith tells us, you see, he tells us in 3rd Nephi what happened after the resurrection. What would Christ do? You would never guess that that's the way things would be carried out. That's the way it was in the old world, apparently, during those 40 days. That's what these documents tell us about. You can see that everybody's quite upset and wondering what to do with them. They're talking about the rediscovery of the gifts today, especially the gift of prophecy. In the Episcopal Church, they want it back again. They say, we have lost, and speaking in tongues, there are societies now in Methodists and Episcopal Churches and so forth of Glossolalia, where they come together and see if they can't speak in tongues. And the anointing, the, the rediscovery of the ordinances. Some churches are seriously thinking of uh, marrying for time and eternity because this is mentioned in these texts again uh, and uh, anointing the sick we mentioned that Catholics are doing that again or the doctrines they talk about the rediscovery of the doctrines in the last bull issued by Pius XII the Mediator Dei bull he speaks of this life as a uh, as an exile we're strangers in the world, we're exiled. Well, of course, this is the only life you ever knew, you wouldn't be an exile. In other words, they're moving in on the doctrine of pre-existence, which is very conspicuous in these early Christian teachings. 
We know today, and it is not denied at all, that the early Christians believed firmly in the pre-existence. Well, the Christian world doesn't. Philastris includes it among the worst of heresies. In the 4th century and in 553, the Council of Constantinople, it was declared a damnable heresy and has never been used by churches since. Yet we get the last pope saying, how about it? This life is an exile. This isn't our real life. We're, we've been cast out of somewhere else, our pre-existence. But they're moving in on these too. Now, this literalism, this is the astonishing thing. These, doctrine, these treatments, there's so much being written now on the literal resurrection, trying to explain it away and saying, well, and yet the, the Christian church has always paid lip service, as you know, to the literal resurrection. It's part of their creeds. How can they do that and still not believe it? It's been tongue-in-cheek with all of them. St. Augustine fixed it, you know, when he said, we believe it's a spiritual resurrection. We can't believe in anything so crass as a physical resurrection. And nobody in his right senses, as Jerome says, no intelligent person could possibly believe a thing like that, and we don't either. Another thing, they're talking about the rediscovery of the gospel. Now you say, just a minute here, rediscovery of the gospel is pretty steep, isn't it? In terms of dispensations, that it has been here before, that Adam had it all, that Abraham had it all, that Noah had it all, uh, that Moses had it all, but they didn't give it all to the people. It didn't all come down. It was necessary to restore it from time to time. So this is what a dispensation is. And today you, you get pamphlets in your mail denouncing the pernicious trend of dispensationism in the churches. I got one quite recently on that because people are coming to think of their religion in terms of that. It must be valid. It goes back to those early dispensations. They had the gospel then. Now this is what's been restored to us. Well, you see how this all... Uh, cast light on our belief. These are the very things that Joseph Smith was persecuted for. This new realism, for example, uh, is, is the most, is the most uh, significant thing. The Christian world has been reconciled for centuries to the belief that these weren't real, the physical resurrection, the literal return of the Lord, supernatural gifts and manifestations, prophecies and revelations. You know, they have been ruled out. You have no idea how vigorously they've been ruled out. They have been the very essence of heresy. That was the essence of heresy in the Reformation. When the Reformation started out, you know, they tried to get back to these things. Then Luther, after a very bitter experience, gave it up. And so did the great reformers. They said they'd have to turn back to scholarship, just like St. Augustine and the rest of them did, because they couldn't deliver it. They wanted the prophecies. They wanted to get the Spirit again. They wanted these gifts uh, and beliefs, but they, they wanted the church. But Luther would never use the word church without uh, every man is a believer. It's a thing that enters in the heart and so forth. The return of Christ, like the resurrection of Christ, is a spiritual experience. He's resurrected to us existentially. This is the line that's being fought out now today. It's the Lutherans more vigorously than any others who are holding the line against this literalism. They're against it more than anybody else, but they're, they're losing just the same. Centuries of hard work have been devoted to de-eschatologizing and de-literalizing the New Testament. And now come new papyri saying that will not do. That is not the way the early Christians talked about it. And after all, this was the world's quarrel with Mormonism for all these years, wasn't it? But this is the real thing. Now, <laughs> if they go about trying to reconstruct things in the light of new documents, far more ancient than any they possessed before, and far more, more authentic, they will certainly have better guides than they'd had before. But it will only be a reconstruction. What about it, Tao? Now, see, Joseph Smith gave his life because he said these things were so. Remember what uh, Lehi says in blessing, I think it's his son Jacob at the end, where he's blessing his son. Remember my son, he says, these things are real. It's very hard for us to, to realize these things are real. The resurrection really took place and the Lord really came and ate with them, unless we've had experiences like that ourselves. But of course, like Thomas, how long did it take Thomas to be converted? About three seconds, didn't it? When he fell down and said, my Lord and my God, he recognized him then. Three seconds before then, he'd give you 10,000 to one that nobody could be resurrected in the flesh. Nobody had been. And that's all it took to convert him. All you have to do is have these gifts. And if you pretend to have the gifts and don't have them, they can work for them and pray for them. But the Lord has put them on the earth here. He's made them available. The Christian world will be held responsible if they don't recognize them. We encourage them in these things. Brigham Young used to say, any time they want to imitate us, any time they're approaching us in any way they can, we wish them more power. But the power in the priesthood which is behind it, this is another thing, incidentally, rediscovery of the priesthood. And of course, this has them worried. There's a group in the Episcopal Church that want to restore the 12 apostles. Well, now that barn door has been shut for an awful long time. I don't know why you start, want to shut it now, because the 12 apostles disappeared long, long ago. They cannot be 
rest uh, they cannot be reformed into existence. They can only be restored. And this is another very interesting thing. You notice that word restoration wasn't used a few years ago. They didn't like restoration. <coughs> the church was all there. You don't have to restore anything. This, their, that was their argument with our idea of, an, of falling away in apostasy. We've always had the Christian church. The Christian name has been here. So they didn't use the word restoration. They always used the word reformation. But as Paul tells us in the letter to the Hebrews, if they've fallen away, can they renew them again to repentance? No, you cannot. He gives the example, remember, of, of Esau who lost the birthright. It was his legitimately, but when he, once he lost it, he tried to get it back again. He said he couldn't. Though he sought it carefully and with tears, he wept for that. He wanted it back so badly it had been his, but he'd lost it. And when you get it back, when you once lost it, he says, you'll never get it back again like that. You can never get it back for yourself. He's talking about the apostasy. Remember, he says, once you've had the Holy Ghost, once we have had these revelations, he says, if we again fall back into darkness, can we renew ourselves to repentance again? If that ever happens, you knew it was going to happen. He says, no, we can't. No, it has to be a restoration. So this is another clue to the literature today. It's not the Mormons. It's everybody else that are talking about restoration today. A bad word a few years ago. Now they're all using it today. It's a strange thing, isn't it? This is the pressure of these documents. They have come forth, I believe, in the due time of the Lord, when you consider that for centuries these documents have been burned by the peasants right around Kinovoski and there, around Nag Hammadi, to heat their huts in the wintertime, that all the Dead Sea Scrolls, which number tens of thousands, are discovered within 15 miles of Jerusalem in territory that's been gone over with a fine-tooth comb for hundreds of years, and none of those 200 caves were known. How could they possibly have missed it? And then all of a sudden, it all pops out. And the two, two libraries discovered the same year, under very much the same circumstances, not uh, documents that have to be painfully reconstructed and traced back to their source, but a whole Jewish library in Palestine that shows us what the Jews were thinking at the time of Christ, a whole Christian library in Egypt show what the Christians were thinking when the curtain came down on the... Uh, at the end of the church, as they were expecting, the end of the dispensation, the time of darkness, they call it, the winter time of the just, the rule of the cosmoponais, the man who leads the world astray, the coming of the false Christ, the time of the deceivers, and so on. Oh, I had more names for it. But that was the end, and they felt it was the end. So they left us their whole library. Now we have something to go by, and we, could, we should be able to wave this under the world's noses. This is not a polite or a, or a sporting thing to do, is it? It's not magnanimous to deal this way so we won't be churlish and say we told you so. Remember what the Lord told Joseph Smith. He says, I will make the Gentiles bring forth the proof. It's not for us to prove the Book of Mormon and these things. We go on and read it and believe it. But the world will prove it for us. And we thank them for that. We also thank the Lord for having given us revelations and prophets in these days and the leaders over us. And I pray that we may increase in our testimonies in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.